All right, go for it. Hello, welcome to the pod. We are now on Spotify and YouTube. Um, coming to you on this wonderful Thursday morning, and uh, we're just going to discuss some stuffs. Getting a little more professional every time. That almost sounds like a real intro. I love it. <laughs> just need some music. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. One of those world reports. You know, just like a little beep. beep, 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 beep. Nice. That's very... <laughs> <laughs> it's not even AI made. It's not even instrument made. It's just <laughs> vocal. It's over like Kanye. Right? <laughs> We're going back to basics. Cool. Well, so this week um, we might be a bit lighter on links, uh, maybe a bit deeper on conversations. Um, but uh, since I have this page up, I will uh, just do a little plug that I have started on my ESP3 development via this M5 stack uh, thing. And I am pulling my hair out. So if anybody's listening and has done uh, basically streaming audio microphone and speaker uh, through an ESP32, give me a shout. I've got some <laughs> basic things working, but uh, can't get it to connect to a web client. Um, anywho, what's new with you, Al? Not that. Sorry, I can't help you, man. Um, what is new with me? I was at a call the other day with a bunch of business owners, and we were talking about uh, there's, you know, somebody there presenting AI and the sentiment is still very much like, a, it, it's mixed, right? Like you've got the people who are still really early coming on board and they're really concerned. And then you've got the people who are way too con- excited. And then you've got the people who are both like, I don't know, maybe kind of like us. I don't know. It's like the, you know, that meme where, you know, uh, Morpheus is holding out the two pills. He's like, you know, take the blue pill and AI saves us. Take the red pill and AI, you know, extincts humanity. Um, and then it cuts to Neo, and then it cuts back to Morpheus. It's like, did you just take both pills? <laughs> right? uh, it feels like that's kind of where people are at. Um, or at least there's that group. Nice. And so I was really, there's, there's fear, and I think a lot of people don't even know what they're afraid of. Like it was, you know, is this, is this, there it is, that's the meme. <laughs> Yeah, did you just take both pill? So, f- applies for the the AI sentiment uh, at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I, I I can definitely feel that. I think um, the people I'm talking to are like both like worried about AI, but then also very excited to get a, a job at an AI company. So it's like a little well, interesting. Um, but these are who's the- making it? Who's making money off AI right now? How do I position myself to make money off of AI? Right? Yeah, or like it's part of the future, and I like to I like to steer it in the right direction, and, mm-hmm. and take both pills, as they say. Who right now do you think is uh, bringing forward a coherent argument? You know, to either side, who do you think is is really kind of bringing it? I guess so making making this- it clear. Open AI um, call for proposals. Have you seen this thing? No. Democratic inputs to AI, which, by the way, Open AI just has beautiful graphic design. Um, it's I just love their stuff. This is um, handsome. Look yeah. at this. It's very nice. And so they look at this, and this is really about their. I think they put two hundred fifty k up there, and said, "Hey, tell us who your team is and what your proposal is." for how people in a democracy can inform how AI should be governed. It was kind of meta because like the proposal should be something that leverages AI. So I think they have a couple examples where, yeah, a statement from a personalization should have its limits and certain controversial topics such as views on substance use must be excluded from AI personalization. Hmm. And then agree or disagree or skip this statement. And then you can say, I disagree, ultimately, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, thank you, we'll record mm-hmm. your uh, your opinion. We have these two clusters of people. You know, would you like to learn more about it? So, so it's very meta. But how could you use AI to help people describe how they feel about how AI should be used and then help them understand more about what they think like as a follow-up so this is like one example of the kind of proposals that they want um but yeah it should be interesting to see who comes through that and i think it's an interesting middle ground yeah there's something really um 
<laughs> well, one, there's something meta about that. And then if you don't notice, you know, how AI is helping you in that process, uh, that says something on its own. Either it's not helpful or it's so good that you don't even notice and you're accomplishing the task, right? Like, you know, good design, sometimes you don't even notice. It just something happens and an outcome is, is reached, right? Um, I saw, so uh, my friend Jordan Harbinger uh, runs a great podcast and he did one with... Um, the sapiens guy, uh, Yuval Yusef, or, what's it's the Yuval sapien? Noah Harari. Noah Harari, yeah, that's it. Um, I, I think it's on YouTube. You can find it. And so he did. He did an interesting one with uh, Yuval, and Yuval has he he's uh, like kind of like he's not anti AI, but he's very AI cautious, right? He's got a lot of things to say in terms of this is going to be tough for us this is going to be challenging we could get this wrong mm -hmm. uh, essentially so i think he's been really he's always such a clear thinker right like you read his books and you're just like wow this is so clearly uh, put together um so if you're looking for someone who has a kind of negative viewpoint uh or at least you know very cautious like i would put him on you know the three quarters of the way to you know cautious he signed to the big petition you know to slow down ai or regulate ai uh research etc um he's got great points and it's a really strong podcast jordan is the consummate professional and comes super prepared it's not a wandering conversation like this one it's really point 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 eval comes super prepared as well so uh that's one i would listen to if you're if if you want to get that viewpoint a little bit more um there's another one I, I heard recently. Um, it was on Tom Bilyeu, and uh, it's the ex-Google guy. What's his name again? Um, oh, Jeremy. Uh, uh, no, Mo Gaudat. Gaudat. Mo Gaudat. Oh, okay. G-A-W-D-A-T. And uh, he... he has a lot of great sound bites mm -hmm. and also makes a great argument for you know ai being super dangerous that you know this is this is it um we're in trouble um yeah that was that was a good one uh, that i heard recently yeah so mom he's i think more on the extreme caution side uh, even more um yeah this guy happiness and artificial intelligence two topics i guess hmm. oh, and so you can see him on, on on tom billy's podcast uh impact theory uh it's really long it's like a two and a half hour conversation so that one's like you know if you're if you're really into it um yeah that's it i think uh mega threat right <laughs> they, they make it a little clickbaity <laughs> Uh -huh. We've lost control of AI. The way that he makes the argument is like, you know, we're kind of already there. It doesn't look and feel like a singularity, but, you know, we're past the event horizon getting pulled towards it, essentially. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you disagree with that? I have to just kind of put ourselves in the historical context of technological disruption and, like, things that have happened before. Uh, and it very much seems to me that this has all kind of happened before. Not to this extent, because, like, everything is kind of cumulative but i just feel like people were talking about trains and like you can't go that fast a human will like start to disintegrate if they go over like <laughs> 40 miles an hour and it's like just crazy things like you see throughout history um of what technology will do and then also crazy things that are like they just creep in and today we're like oh that's that's kind of obvious like we spend all of our time inside like all of our time we spend inside yeah. It's like and, 97, 98 percent, right? Yeah, to the point where, like, you know, they brought all these kids and people into factories, and they had to like infuse vitamin D into milk so that their like bones wouldn't disintegrate. And now we're just like, oh yeah, the vitamin D's in milk. That kind of makes sense. But it's like <laughs> those things are crazy, and they yeah. seem like so so obvious to us now. And the things that like feel really scary to me are like, at some point. Yeah, at some point it either either just becomes like routine, like oh yeah, obviously I have to like inject myself with foreign 
pathogens because we live in a global society where these things roam free. And I do that when I'm, you know, child all the way till when I'm 90. Um, that's crazy. Like that's a crazy technology that we didn't have before. Uh, yep. and we take it for granted. And then there's other things we're like so drawn back by, um, like, uh, I don't know, I guess like AI, but I'm trying to think about like another current, oh yeah, this is a great example. 15 minute cities. Have you heard What's about a... this conspiracy? No. What's a 15 minute city? So when I was at Sidewalk, uh, you know, the whole notion in urban planning, um, well, maybe for the past couple, maybe decade, uh, there's like kind of this notion of new urbanism which is walkable communities uh, developed in a way that is like not necessarily in the center of the city, but they're kind of, like, they're almost like retirement communities, um, this new urbanism. And it feels downtown-y, but it's like just recently been built, but they kind of like have homage to like the town square and stuff. Anyway, trend is like, be like Amsterdam, right? Be like Copenhagen, like allow people to have bikes. In Florida, it's like golf carts, like people just riding around in golf carts. But basically, be able to walk to anything in 15 minutes. So your bakery, your library, your work, your school, your friends. You can walk in 15 mm -hmm. minutes. That's kind of like the holy grail of urban development. Then, I think like Jordan Peterson or something got hold of this. And it must have been like some subreddit tweet thing that started it. But it's basically now seen as this global Schwab conspiracy to keep people in their neighborhoods walled off from other people and not allow them to leave and contain them in small boxes. And it's like so crazy to see this thing that's like just logical urban design. Of course, people want to walk yeah. where they want to go turned into, oh, because the elites want this, therefore, there must be a sinister motive. And I think mm. that will just happen more and more. And that's what I feel about this AI stuff. It's like, it's overblown to the point where it's not a helpful discussion anymore. I will listen to these things because I also enjoy the, the kind of like, what if um, everything blows up kind of thing. But, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I just, I, you know, when I, when I see kind of like quick baby headlines, um, that's what I think about is like, this can, this, though this is acting what see in seemingly a virtuous way, this can act against us and remove all nuance from things like 15 minute cities where you're like, actually, this is, this is wonderful. I would like to walk where I want to go. That's the way to live. That's why I never want to leave, you know, this neighborhood, right? Um, it's two things there. One is the, uh, do you know about the, the protect versus promote mindset? No. So there's this idea that most of us lay somewhere on a spectrum between protect and promote. We have protectors who are really good at making sure bad things don't happen. And then there's the promoters who are really good at making sure or trying to make good things happen anyway. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like a mindset where you either tend to see opportunities and try to make those come true, or you tend to um, see value in what's there and try to protect and improve or, uh, you know, sort of keep that value as it is. And so I think a lot of, a, a good percentage of this, I bet if you looked at the loud voices about why AI is so dangerous, you would probably see that they're, uh, you know, protect mindset people. And when you go to the loud voices of, you know, AI is going to save the world, um, you would probably get people who are more in a promoter mindset just as a thought experiment i bet you could go in and uh you know sort of you could measure those people in some way if you can do this not gross set this promote and and uh, uh promote promote okay. and protect is the idea what's the uh is there like a book or something i don't know where i heard this it's just just, just a thing okay. to first is promote just go to images See, you know, there's always like should be a chart yeah. mentality, protect versus promote uh, mentality. Uh, there's that one, and then there's uh, did we talk about this before? The eight thousand to one ratio. 
Um, the witch? 8,000 to 1. 8,000 to 1. No, but I'm going to get 15 minute cities just to like highlight that this is insane. Cities <laughs> conspiracy. Is it Reddit? Let's see. The 15 minute city spread uh, conspiracy threat spread. This is big. Look at all this. Yeah. Super relevant links. Yeah, it's so nuts. That's a socialist prison. <laughs> it's awesome. That's not freedom. Oh, we got QAnon people here. We got it all. Yeah, it's all connected. It's all connected. All right. Okay, anyway, there's the link. Um, but you were saying? 8001 is for every new technology, 8,000 actors will use it for good. For each one actor, will use it for bad. Right. So any technology tends to have the, uh, you know, yeah, there it is, bad actors. Uh, yeah, it's good to bad actors, essentially, is what it is, uh, roughly. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Dismantle bad actors' business models. Interesting. Okay, well, there you go. Um, and so, yeah, it's like some people are going to use this stuff for bad. Um, did you hear the example recently where uh, some scientists were using drug develop? They're working on drug development, mm -hmm. and they were essentially asked AI some open questions around how to uh, increase longevity. Uh, generally, and then they give it some, you know, uh, you have to engineer this stuff a little bit, right? From there, um, they were able to create some early frameworks for things that look, might look promising, right? Like essentially sketches of potential products and drugs. For fun, they flipped it around and said, you know, what are some ways we could decrease longevity? And with, within six hours, AI produced 40,000, essentially, ways to kill people, <laughs> which I find is absolutely hilarious and alarming, right? 40,000 uh, potential poisons and ways to, you know, decrease lifespan. And so when you think about it from a bad actor perspective, um, it's, you know, only bad things happen fast, right? Um, there's you know, another way of... And so sort of phrasing it. So yeah, bad things can happen pretty quick. Uh, yeah. When used in the wrong way. That is interesting. Yeah, you can kind of like, you can imagine a couple like really good scenarios, but you can imagine a lot of bad scenarios. Like you can imagine yeah. like, so, it's like the many ways to die. I don't know what, I think it's like a video game. Different ways yep. to die. But um, there's a movie 2000 ways to die in the West, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just like, yeah, because your mind goes wild. And I, I think we're kind of programmed to, like, seek out those threats, like, just psychologically, right? You're, like, looking 100%. for the hole or you're looking for the predator. Um, and, yeah, that's that's cortisol. That's the anxiety that we're just, like, running with. Yeah. Um, and it, here's another one, too. I don't know if you know about this. You see it prevalently in business. And maybe we talked about this already, but this idea of um, opportunity. So let's say you have five products and every week – the leadership team is meeting to discuss the products and there's one that's just always a little bit behind um you know the revenue's below where it should be oh we didn't get as many customers signing up for this thing as we should have the nps is lower than it should be etc that product will inevitably get more of the leadership team's attention mm -hmm. um, because they're trying to fix it because it's a problem yeah whereas that same amount of energy put into a winning product you could double it as opposed to just getting, you know, something from 20% below track back to track. Yeah. Right. Um, so we tend to have this problem solving and, uh, you know, pain aversion uh, mentality rather than saying, you know what, let's just not worry about that. And let's focus on where the big wins are. Uh, that's hard for people to do. And I think when it, this is why news is so exciting, right. You know, it's designed that way. It's not designed to help you actually learn anything about what's going on in the world it's designed to yeah. get your cortisol up and get excited and pay attention to problems um and that's, yeah. that's what's novel right it's like yeah i mean pinker talks about this but um you know positive progress happens in very small steps and bad things happen like you're saying like really fast and that's what makes the headlines right it's like earthquake but you'd like people slowly over decades 
uh, mostly out of poverty, uh, doesn't doesn't make it. Like most people have a refrigerator. Yep. Uh, Stairs uh, up, elevator down. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, cool. So I thought maybe I would share some uh, non AI things. Um, can, can I share one more? Yeah, just yeah. as like a positive voice, because we just shared a couple of negative ones. Um, A16Z dot com slash AI. These guys love it. You know, they're they're like you mentioned before. They're all in on bubbles. Um, if you just go to their homepage and then scroll down uh, a little bit, AI and A16, AI, yeah, there it is, general. So they've got their whole, you know, page of content and stuff that they do here around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're doing an okay job of, you know, I think promoting, you know, the possibility and uh, debunking, you know, some of the myths that, uh, you know, are spread pretty quickly. You know, there's this idea that uh, the a lie gets halfway around the world by the time the truth has its uh, time to get its shoes before the truth gets its shoes on, right? Like, uh, okay. and I think that yeah. they're doing good work to try to make things positive, uh, essentially. And so, they've got some content here, a couple of sort of pillar pages. They've got like a essentially like their AI canon, which is, you know, a great set of links for any type of builder to check out. So, you know, I think they're definitely putting a lot of money into it, into their own portfolio, and they're putting a lot of money into educating the market as well. So Mm -hmm. I'm happy to share their stuff. Cool. Yeah. I mean, on that note, um, one must, of course, uh, I'm just going to point out the podcast to listen to on Lex Friedman, which one of the most recent one is Mark Andreessen and uh, yep. very fast talker, but that was an excellent one. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, for sure. That was a great one. He talks about yep. kind of agents and how it won't be one AI, uh, but many AIs. Mm-hmm. So highly like recommend team, those two. Right? It's like, like the idea of a team. Like you don't just have one person doing everything. You've got, you know, a group. Uh, that accomplish it something. They all have special yeah. skills. And like different characters, like you might want just like a funny person that you're talking to or like somebody who's going to help you like yep. artistically, creatively. Um, and I like that notion because then it takes it away from being like, even if we go back to like the open AI thing, like running through this is basically how should AI as a monolith respond? What should the boundaries of AI be? But it's like, well... Maybe if I'm talking to like a librarian, there's some boundaries I don't want them to cross. Right. And if I'm talking to like a psychotherapist AI, there's other boundaries that are like different and moving. Yeah. Um, and if I'm talking to someone who's, you know, uh, a, an AI entertainer or storyteller, um, you know, they can, facts don't matter, right? Like, it doesn't need to be factual. In fact, you know, I want to hear stories, uh, you know, in that context. Um, and, you know, but keep the stories, you know, PG. 13 because I'm listening to it with my 12 year old or something, right? Totally. Yeah, totally. Um, there's an AI, uh, there's an idea that I was working on recently. Tell me if this resonates with you just in terms of product development. We've been looking at, you know, in our portfolio where, where AI is going to be a part of software, you know, in the future. And so far I, I see kind of two categories, you know, one is <clears throat> software as it is today with individual features kind of enhanced, you know, by AI. So, you know, you're you're writing an email and you you get some auto complete on something, or, you know, you're reading something and you get a summarize summarization of it, or, um, you are brainstorming and you want five more topics about it. So there was already a brainstorming mind map type feature. And then it's just like, well, let's just add generative AI to complete this task. Right. So it's the workflow is generally the same. It's just kind of sped up. You know, like you can kind of almost like fast forward through a portion of it with AI. On the other side is these, you know, completely different use cases of something we just couldn't do before, where you're almost fast forwarding through all of the workflow straight to the end, where you're almost just like asking for what you want or getting some sort of information or task completed that previously took just cutting out almost the entire workflow and Mm -hmm. we're essentially transforming the way that looks uh, completely, if not skipping it uh, completely. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I can see so far in terms of like a spectrum 
and how I've been thinking about it a little bit in terms of, okay, if we're looking at this market, how might we be able to use these new technologies uh, in this market? Either it's improving existing workflows and creating sort of shortcuts and fast forwards, or this like much more like big fast forward or completely different way of, of doing it uh, than in the past. Does that track for you? Would you poke a hole in that or tell me why you think it's right? Yeah, no, like that, that, uh, that tracks. I think there's a couple things there. One is, um, I think about input output. So like, you know, when we first had the computer, there's like, maybe the output was like beeps and boops or just like, uh, you know, a feed of, uh, numbers. Cause it yeah, was a punch computer. cards input, punch yeah. cards input and like yeah. answer output. Um, and then you have like terminal where it's like, you know, text in, text out, uh, and then you have GUIs and then you have like buttons for, and you basically encapsulate like a text command or something that would take a, like, maybe it's a function, which would take a lot to write and run. And you've put it into a button and you have this kind of new form of output, which isn't like a, a linear terminal. It's kind of like now you're dealing with two dimensional space. Um, and that in that you create a whole new suite of products that couldn't exist before, like photo editing, you know, mm. word processing layout, you know, video editing, like all, all the visual, uh, programs that we know now. Um, so I think about input and output and like, does the input and output change? Or like you're saying, do you just skip a whole bunch of stuff in between and you like have the same input, but you get the output, uh, or is it like, this is a button in Photoshop? And like I used, I used to have like type in terminal like to crop an image. I don't know, and, and right, now there's right. like a button for that, and so it's, it augments your workflow. Um, and so maybe like the way to understand that is, is is the person that do they do they get a new tool in the existing um, program software workflow they have, or did you replace the person in some in some way, or like at least that mode of their job? Did they do they just not open that program anymore? Mm. Yeah, I think that that feels much like, you know, how I was thinking of it, especially in that transformative perspective. Uh, yeah, it's. I think and then how many thing... people got uh, how many people got replaced along the way? Mm -hmm. And then what is the person doing now? Right. Like, and, you know, is there someone do you buy into this idea of like job contraction, uh, like, you know, less people having work to do? I, what I think is humans are basically, um, we seek suffering. So I cannot see, <laughs> like there's meaning in suffering, but I think we seek that out. And like all the jobs that exist today, like we don't really need to be doing these things. They're like ridiculous things. Like what are we doing right now? We're just like kind of podcast sharing links. Like we don't need to be doing this, but people seek that. It's like a journey. It's an adventure. And um, so like, will there be jobs? I mean, why does somebody make my coffee? Like we've had coffee robots for decades. Like why does somebody make my coffee? Yeah. Um, because I have a sensitivity to this and, uh, you've all know her already talks about, I have a sensitivity to this. They have a sensitivity to this. I value the qualities of that, which include like knowing the history of where it's from and like having a connection there. And so like that, that is separate from the kind of Marxist conception of like, factory work, capital, output, labor, commodities, there's like a new economy. And I think what could happen is just like even more of the economy shifts to sensitivity um, based and attention based products rather than hard commodities. And we've seen that like there's way less farmers than there used to be. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So it's already. Yeah. The, no the number of people required to earn you know, a uh, million dollars just goes down every year, right? Partially because of inflation, but also, you know, even if you inflation adjust it, it's still really on a downtrend. Um, and that means that production per person is going up, right? Uh, mm -hmm. if, like the amount of value each individual can create, um, you know, goes up, which means that technology is theoretically deflationary, meaning that each unit of value, um, you know, costs less so you can get more for less money. Uh, is the, the idea there. Jeff Booth, uh, fellow Canadian shout out, uh, does a lot of, uh, he, he writes about this topic a lot in the context of like innovation, 
uh, in technology, and he's also a big Bitcoiner. He's really into uh, you know Bitcoin specifically more than crypto in general. Um, Jeff Booth, uh, there might be an E on the end of that. That's him. Oh yeah, Jeff Booth. Um, he's got a few great, great ideas on this. But the idea that technology is deflationary, meaning that back to the original question about job growth, if he can, if, if we can create technology that requires less work to get everything we need, then we need to work less. And that the hours that everyone should have to work go down because the amount of hours you need to work to pay for the things you need uh, go uh, go down as well. Mm-hmm. So, yes, there is potentially job contraction, but it's offset by the fact that everything is easier to get. Mm. If yeah. I understand his argument correctly. Mm-hmm. I can see that. I think that it is a very material take on what work is about. I think that that has happened and it will happen. You need only look at the rust belt, you know, and um, yeah. manufacturing. It leaves a hole of purpose uh, in those communities. And I think that's the missing piece here is like, what is the story we can tell ourselves about, not that we're working less, but we have more time to do the good work we believe is important, right? Mm. Like just because you're not paid for something doesn't mean it's not hard and it's not work and it's not valuable. And I think there is like a weird, there is a weird um, economic lens on things that says the more you pay somebody for something, the more valuable it is because we use the same word. We say it's valuable, but then like, what's the most valuable job? Like, I think it is being a parent in which you pay to do that. So, and I think it's out of whack. Like, I think our modern, (laughs) our modern conception of what's valuable is out of whack and you can slip into that. Like you can slip into like, Oh, am I adding enough value here and forget like, Oh wow. Like life is not a bank account. Like life is not a balance sheet. Um, yeah, so I think it, it will be good to see who has a lens that not only says like, hey, you're gonna work less, but you're actually gonna work more, you know? And you're gonna work more on things that matter. And you're gonna work on them because they matter to you and to your community and people you care about. Where the important uh, jump for that is that people are willing to take the time to actually look inside themselves and see what matters. And that's like a huge hump that many never get over and are kind of willing to accept, you know, it's, it's, it's the pathless path versus, uh, there's a book about this too. It's called the pathless path, uh, where, you know, the default mode was, you know, go get a job. You know, it doesn't necessarily matter what it is. Just make sure it's a quote unquote good job. Right. Um, as opposed to, exploring and uh accepting you know this the idea of fluidity and trying to figure out what matters to you because that doesn't come automatically what is the real work uh, you know the, the the line there that you need to do and you know how much of that is you know professional and how much of it is personal um yeah you know, what does that pie chart look like could be different for everyone and that's you know that's cool um yeah, and I can't there's help a huge think... jump just to get people to that point, though, and yeah. it requires such important self-reflection. And in general, there's a lot of fear around even going down that path because it is less um, known. Uh, it is a scarier path in most cases for most people. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's unlikely. Like basically, you know, this has happened before. This will happen again. You know, there was a time when cities were less populated than urban and then uh, rural areas. And it was strange to go to the city. And you basically had a merchant class who would like go to the city and they kind of trailblazed, hey, like this can be a thing that you do. And then slowly people move to the city and now there's more people in cities than there are in in rural Mm -hmm. areas. And so like that's a path, like somebody had to walk the pathless path, but then there's like demonstration that this is something that's desirable and then people follow, there's like more books like this. Yeah, and I, I wonder, like, because I think most people won't do that. Most people shouldn't do that. I mean, the thing that makes society work is we have customs, rituals, cultures, and norms. Um, but then the question is, like, how can there be a new norm that makes space for some kind of, like, 
um, something that is a higher uh, priority than economic value. I think that's the that's the challenge of what we have, which is kind of an agnostic, multicultural, pluralist society, is that uh, morality and virtue and kind of like the deeper human value takes a back seat to the laws and regulations we need to follow to just live together. So we start mm -hmm. start being like, okay, let's agree on the laws. Let's not agree on like the tenets of what it is to be good. Let's agree on like when we put you in jail and what it is to be bad. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like the makes me think of the other way. Yeah, it's definitely right. Uh, you know, there's I looked this up. There's a chart of values, like American values, over the last twenty years, and the values of essentially like community. Um, it could be 50 years, like Chart of American Values, if you look it up. Maybe it's... That one on the right, P-R-R-I, maybe? The point of the chart is the people's emphasis on money as a value has gone up, you know, over the last 50 years. No, that's not it. Um people's e emphasis on community, on um, family, on health and wellness has gone down uh, over the last 50 years. And none of this is not Oh, is that it? Yeah, there we go. Hard work. So, yeah, where, where do millennials sit on these values? Notice that self-fulfillment is higher. Where's money? Now this is a different one, but it kind of gets the same point across. Um, Less value in patriotism, belief of God, having children, hard work. Financial security is even. Tolerance for others, higher. And self-fulfillment, higher in the mm -hmm. current generation, mm -hmm. um, 18 to 38. Interesting. People who say that yeah, the one that I saw was like very specifically like community, um, hard work, et cetera, those things we're down and uh, money was way up in general so financial security is maybe a different way of framing it i see yeah yeah i mean it is interesting to see uh, how these things change um and i think like what's curious to me is like what is the story because like all these things have a story right um we listen to stories stories affect us like for me, stories of the internet, you know, connectivity, even the story, the notion of diversity is a, is a modern story. Oh, that's, that's a good thing. You know, Canada, obviously a, a country of immigrants. It would be a different story if, you know, grew up in Germany or China or like a place that has a long history and story around um, the people who are there. So I think like the, this is to me points at a changing story and there is definitely a modern story of self-fulfillment, know yourself, like we we're just talking about, like reflect on yourself. But then there is a kind of like, mm, a, I would say a problematic uh, aversion to children and the importance of children. Like, that's weird. Like, I had that. I was like, I never want to have kids. And I'm reflecting on that. I'm like, what a crazy idea. What a crazy idea to say, like, I don't want to help the next generation exist like and so but i think it's like actually something that we've turned into a virtue um and i i was listening to the cbc ideas podcast about overpopulation and there mm. was an explicit effort uh to they did this population control in india and i think they like sterilized a bunch of people and then everybody was yeah like, this is crazy stop doing this this is like involuntary um sterilization and basically got together uh, and decided what we need to do is encourage a voluntary uh, world where you have like less children. Um, and and it's interesting that that experiment was conducted on me. Um, and like, I feel that, like I feel like growing up, I was like, oh, I don't wanna have children. Like it's, there's too, there's too many people in the world and like it's making things worse. But it's like, who's gonna solve our problems? Like it's gonna be children. And, uh, and so, yeah, it, it, I think this is worth listening to. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I always like ideas for stimulating podcasts. 
Yeah, there's. Uh, I remember the first time I was exposed to the idea that the solution to the population problem is the population problem, right? Each one of us is consuming more resources. You know, we're, you know, killing the planet. We're killing each other. Blah blah blah. More people are going to make things worse. No, more people are going to make things better because we have more minds, you know, working on the problem. Bringing it back to, you know, the, you know, AI as, you know, saving the world. It's like, okay, well, now we can add a lot more intelligence. Uh, essentially, without adding, you know, more resource conf- uh, consuming humans. Um, and that our ability to start to solve the problems we identify is, you know, exponentially cranking upwards, right? And, you know, we're watching it this year, like, you know, and again, imagine somebody who had been in AI since like 2013, right? And, you know, 2014, it's like, yeah, same people at the conference next year, and you're all off in the corner, and nobody cares what you're thinking, yeah. and you're talking about this artificial intelligence, you're like, oh, yeah, cool, like the movies, right? Haha, <laughs> when's that going to happen, 2050? And then, you know, every every year, just like a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, until, you know, 2021, 2022, we start to see, like, holy smokes, this works, and then chat GPT, first product to a billion users before, like, within what was it three months or something um it was faster than any other product in history um yeah that's that if ai is going to save us that line of thinking of the solution to the population problem um is the population really yeah resonates with me like there's just like like through ai added like billions of new people in some way in some way and exactly yeah intelligence yeah that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's a crazy thought. Yeah. So shall we shift? Um, yeah. Let's see some, what, what did you see that was cool this week? I have to. So like, I think my interests are also within, um, you know, 3d XR AR stuff. I'm just oh, yeah. pop open some links because obviously hey, did we talk about Apple vision pro. I don't yet? think we really talked about the Apple vision pro. So got to talk about that. Um, but I, I think that's, maybe we can get to that inside of this stuff. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that might be like a whole episode where we just got to spend a lot of time on, on all these topics. And yeah. Something you're definitely a professional on. Um, cool. So, uh, this is maybe a mix of, oh yeah. So maybe this is a mix of like urban stuff and XR, but we have a new mayor. Olivia. Congratulations. Olivia. Yeah. She made it. Exciting. Um, my most exciting things is like, we're going to keep our bike lanes and hopefully we won't rebuild the gardener and you know, use the <laughs> for something else. Um, let it crumble, let it burn. Yeah. I thought, you know, that, you know, we were talking earlier in the podcast about kind of divisive or like clickbaity headlines. I'm like, AI is all bad. AI is all good. And I think there was that happening with bike lanes in Toronto. Uh, and this is just something around, um, you know, how you can have bike corridors, like dedicated bike yep. uh, streets. But um, people were talking about, like, get rid of the bike lanes or keep the bike lanes. And there wasn't a conversation about, like, hey, perhaps bike lanes belong on their own dedicated streets that are within neighborhoods. Because, mm-hmm. like, I ride from here to, like, you know, uh, Young Street, let's say. And the bike corridor is sketchy, like it's broken, like you got to yep. cross streets and the lights don't work. But there are these neighborhood streets like this one where you do have kind of like, this is primarily a bike street. If you're a car, pay attention. This is primarily a bike street like Argyle and stuff like that yep. um, and Shaw. And so uh, this is the third option. You know, like there's always this like this, <laughs> yes, no, there's always like a kind of like maybe both, you know. Um, yeah, it's not a, it's not necessarily an or situation. It's like it's like this or this, or also this or and you know this. Yeah, yeah, and like as a biker, I would love to like ride down this tree filled street safely without cars humming by me. You know, if that yep. was as good as blur, or even if it took like a little couple minutes more, that's fine with me. Um, and so yeah, more third options. I'm I'm hopeful for. Love it. Uh, this is just another, I, I guess I just have a lot of bike tweets, but Montreal knows how to do this. Um, and I think there's like one more urban ish tweet. Uh, maybe not. 
Okay. So, uh, so let's talk about 3D stuff. So this is a really cool library by um, this guy. I don't know how to pronounce that. O X C A O A uh, called React 3 Fiber, and this is all HTML. Uh, you can kind of go to the demo, and uh, it's really simple code. It's like making HTML, but you are you are making like a 3D uh, experience. And so I think the really exciting thing about Apple Vision Pro is that they've upgraded web apps to be like primary citizens, which took Apple like a really long time to build. But you can see this is like mm. HTML, and then you transition in. Uh, how do I do this? I think I oh, double click. And then now I'm inside of this portal, and then I can go back. And so this... we're looking at, oh, so each these cards essentially, in this interface anyway, I can click on a card and zoom into it as if it was a room almost, like a yeah. doorway to a 3D space or a room. Like a what are the contexts where this would be useful? Give me like a use case where I would want to build something like this. Yeah, I think about it like, um, well, like I think about it like images on the internet. You know, people are like, oh, yeah. you know, Mark Andreessen talks about this in the interview, and people don't want images. Like it should just be text. And like, no, images could actually be pretty cool. And then like images, are great. images and you're like, holy crap, like it's the internet. And so this is like, basically, what if spaces existed on the internet? Um, wow. What would that do? And so there's or like- seen so much, right? Yeah, and there's like visuals to that, but like, how does that change your mental model of like where you are when you click in here? Um, yeah. Versus, it's like a new type of navigation, new mental model for where you are, but I think provides new experiences. The exciting thing about this though, is like, this is the code. Like that's the code. It's like, for that teapot and, stuff like code um so the tea, teapot here is just a model so you can just pull oh, in okay. like 3d models but yeah. basically it's this frame uh and it has a certain uh uh treatment so it's like a clipping mask um and yep. then they just move the position when you click on the thing so it's it's really exciting because it's super super fast runs on the web which is on any platform uh it's 3d and um yeah you can kind of go nuts I can assume like the easy, like the really easy um, use cases would be like e-commerce, right? Like you can go check out a product or, uh, you know, kind of like see it within a context or a space. Mm -hmm. um, the second one I would see is probably like real estate. I can imagine it's pretty good. Imagine like moving between different rooms, you know, anything that has something to do specifically with, um, with space. Um, industries that try to just depict space online. This is where I love to use chat GPT for market uh, generation on this. Like uh, I was talking to someone about a product that was, it was had to do with smells, right? And so there, essentially there's a way to make noise canceling headphones for your nose. Um, it's this chemical thing. And uh, you know, as we did it, we're, we're saying like, okay, we had some bad use cases for it. We're like, okay, well, what are the what are the places where people complain most about this problem mm -hmm. of smells? And then we're like, oh, okay, these are some interesting verticals. Okay, which of these verticals actually have money, right? And yeah, wondering about how to use this, and I would totally use ChatGPT to start brainstorming uh, areas where this type of technology can be applied quickly and see immediate lift, and people would be receptive to it as well. Of like, oh yeah, this just makes the thing I was already trying to do better, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's like back to your kind of division of like stuff that helps you do your job better. This is, to me is like rounded corners on the internet. It's like rounded a rectangle. It's like, oh, this, yeah. this feels nice with drop shadows, it's an aesthetic piece. So you, you see this in websites now. But then the question is like, what is the crazy new use case? Like yeah. once it starts doing something crazy and I've seen definitely some like multiplayer online worlds built in um, 3JS. And that's where it gets a bit nuts. Like you're moving around this place. It basically becomes a video game. Like what if you're browsing the internet was a video game? Um, yeah. So we'll see. Cool. Uh, so that's that. And um, let's see here. Yeah, I think these are like just like cool little 3D things. Like this is like a pixelated 3D mesh builder. Um, mm. So you can like actually draw <laughs> the mesh and like feel like fun. a retro game. Um, some cool card stuff. 
Uh, yeah, and this is like, again, it's like little aesthetics. Just making the internet feel a little better, a little cooler every day, man. Yeah. Love it. And it runs on a phone. That's the crazy thing, because everything has like a, a GL, open GL. Mm. This is a cool thing, which is like a map where you can put these pins. It's collaborative, and then it has like the AR representation of it. So it's like an open source uh, toolkit. Uh, but you can see the pin in like the video feed and then also on the map. And I think you can you can zoom out to the world. It's just kind of a nuts Wild. Sort of use case. This is um, uh, somebody who kind of broke down the new Apple Vision Pro. So this is where we get into the Vision Pro of like the blur effect. So blur yep. has never been more utilitarian than now because if you're in mixed reality, you need to walk around and know where you are. And so rather than just being an aesthetic cool thing that you see on your desktop, you like literally need to know if something's moving quickly behind this this blurred um, view. Uh, and right. this guy just broke, breaks down how to do that uh, using, uh, using web technology, which is like multiple stacked layers of blurs. Um, mm. Yeah. Rad. We're gonna have to talk more about Apple Vision Pro uh, on its own thing. In another episode. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is a Vision Pro like prototype. And we'll just see more of these things as like people start developing for it. They have like really good developer tools that let you like show a fake room. This looks to me like it was done in After Effects. Yeah. Um, but the notion that you can kinda like now move out to the world uh and apply shaders and like stuff can feel real um mm -hmm. exciting yeah that was, that's a cool transition from you're sitting in your room to your back in the room and you're in a completely different room that was one thing that i noticed is the most of the workspaces that you know uh, apple has in their um promotional material or like this dude standing at this like huge table and this like gorgeous big open loft space and it's got like the big screens and stuff around them it's like i could just work in a closet you know what i mean like <laughs> i don't need this space when everything's virtual yeah, essentially yeah. right like i was i was seeing the rest of my room improving this it's like no just give it the big screens you mm -hmm. know like i can use my you know head to look between them if that's helpful but yeah cleaning up the workspace and allowing focus to the content is i don't know it doesn't feel like a bad thing to me right away it's a, a small small take on that uh, yeah yeah all right cool yeah so that's all i got well that's all i got so what's the biggest takeaway for you today what do you what do you feel like you learned hmm i don't think i'm on it too I, I guess I'm, I'm, I, I'm kind of like on this, like somebody's going to come up with a conspiracy for 15 minute cities, like whatever <laughs> good thing you think that is just so good could be, and will be turned into a conspiracy theory. Right. Um, what do you got? Um, I'm going to go with a, <laughs> to me. It's, it's, it's that remembering yeah there's always the detractors there's always people who are gonna you know tear things down and you know there's always the if you ever if you heard this thing this is maybe this is a good way to end it you know you could take a chef and turn him into a pretty good food critic but you can't take a food critic and turn him into a chef nearly as easily mm. right it's always easier to be a critic it's always easier to detract than it is and consume and detract than it is to create uh and and, and serve uh, essentially so that's my take we need more chefs that's for sure more chefs yeah. thanks for the time patrick thanks for the time everyone for listening we'll see you next time see ya